Her story began over 55 years ago in Gombe, Tanzania, with her study of chimpanzees. Sent to observe them by the scientist Louis Leakey, she soon made groundbreaking discoveries about how closely their behavior resembled our own. After about four months, one of the chimpanzees, whom I named David Greybeard because he had a beautiful white beard, and he began to lose his fear of me. So on this very special day, I'm walking through the forest, and I see David sitting on a termite mound, and I see him reach out and break off grass stems and push them into holes in the termite mound and bite off the termites with his lips, crunch them up. I saw him picking leafy twigs and to make those into tools, he had to pull off the leaves. So at that time, it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools. So that was the breakthrough observation. Because of David, more and more chimpanzees were getting used to me. And so I was beginning to really learn something about their their personalities because they're all different and uh, the way they communicate with postures and gestures same as ours kissing embracing holding hands patting one another swaggering throwing rocks and also about their complex social structure their territorial the males patrol a boundary around their territory and attack individuals from neighboring communities kill them actually uh, to protect the resources for their females and young. So, as I was learning all of this, it became increasingly apparent how like us they are. After two years at Gombe, Louis Leakey decided that Jane Goodall needed a formal qualification to underpin her fieldwork. So she went to Cambridge University to take a PhD in the science of animal behavior. But her approach was in stark contrast to the conventional wisdom of the time. So when I got there, I was extremely nervous, hadn't been to college, and imagine how I felt when many of the professors told me I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names that wasn't scientific, they should have been numbered. I couldn't talk about them having personality or minds capable of problem solving nor emotions like happiness, sadness, fear, despair. But although I was nervous of the professors, I knew that in this respect they were wrong because of the lessons I'd learned from my dog Rusty as a child. And so I stood up for myself. I had a wonderful supervisor who actually came out to Gombe and understood what I was talking about. He's the one who helped me to think and write in a scientific, logical way, which I love, but maintaining the, the empathy with these amazing beings that I was living with and learning from. So because chimpanzees are so like us biologically, we differ from them in the structure of DNA by only just over 1%. And the similarities in st structure of blood and, and immune system and anatomy of the brain. Science gradually had to come out of this narrow reductionist way of thinking. Jane Goodall was born in London in 1934, but spent most of her childhood on the south coast in Bournemouth. Her mother was always a positive influence. I think I was actually born loving animals. People were always asking me, where did you, you know, what triggered your love of animals? It was just born that way. And the main thing is I had a very supportive mother. And then when I was 10, this was World War II raging, and we had very little money. And I used to save up my few pennies of pocket money and spend hours in this little second-hand bookshop. And I found this small book, which I still have. Uh, it was called Tarzan of the Apes. I read it from cover to cover. And of course, I fell passionately in love with this glorious Lord of the Jungle. And what did he do? He went and married the wrong Jane. 
But of course I knew there wasn't a Tarzan. But that's when my dream began. I would grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. Because in those days women didn't become scientists going out in the field. In fact, there weren't really any men going out in the field to study animals. Everybody laughed at me. But it was my mother who said, if you really want this, then you're going to have to work very hard. After her PhD, Goodall went back to Africa to continue her work. And in 1977, she set up the Jane Goodall Institute to protect chimps and try and save their habitats. It was shocking to see right across Africa, chimp numbers were plummeting, forests were being cut down, the bushmeat trade began, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, foreign logging companies and mining companies were coming in, building roads into the forest, human populations around the forest were growing, and clearing more and more forest to live on, to grow food, to graze cattle and so forth. Goodall has spent over 30 years campaigning to preserve the environment. The impetus for that came from a conference in 1986 when she first learned how chimpanzee habitats were being destroyed. People were struggling to survive. The land was overused and infertile. That's when it hit me. If we don't do something to improve things for these people, to help them find ways of living without destroying the environment, then we can't even try to save the chimpanzees. And I went to that conference, which was four days as a scientist, had my PhD, had a research station, an amazing life, and I left as an activist. This led to a change of emphasis for the Jane Goodall Institute. By the 1990s, it had moved on from just chimpanzee protection to community conservation, supporting struggling rural populations. One program aimed to improve food production across Tanzania. And the first things were growing more food, so that meant restoring fertility to the overused farmland without chemicals and then introducing up-to-date high-resolution maps, take them to the villagers. And it was amazing to see a woman looking at this map and saying, that's the tree where I put my baby while I'm working in the fields. And the previous maps were drawn on the sand with the finger. And so because of this, we were able to help them make their land use management plans. They wanted better education, for their children and uh, better health. We managed to build a few extra school rooms and to build some clinics. And so the people began to trust us and then we could introduce water management programs. Then we introduced our microcredit programs and scholarships to keep girls in school during and after puberty because it's been shown all around the world that as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. The Jane Goodall Institute has been responsible for setting up a range of imaginative projects to help people into sustainable livelihoods. One of the big problems in, in Africa is finding ways that people can live without destroying the environment. And it turns out that beekeeping is one such program. Putting up hives in the trees turns out to be an amazing way. The forest becomes very important because from the honey they're getting, they're able to sell it and making livelihoods from honey. And it's fascinating in some parts of Africa where you get big problems for the village farmers because of elephants moving in turns out elephants are really scared of bees. When you think that bees are attracted to moisture, you imagine getting bees up your trunk. Oh, what a horrible thought. So they're now putting just strands of wire around the crops and the elephants come along and touch the wire and immediately the bees buzz out and the elephants go away. So it's, it's fantastic. Roots and Shoots is the youth movement of the Jane Goodall Institute. 
founded in Tanzania in 1991, it now operates worldwide as a vehicle for youth to act to prevent species loss and to practice conservation. The main message, every individual matters, makes a difference every single day. And we decided that each group would choose a project to help people, a project to help animals, and a project to help the environment. And so the projects that they choose vary enormously depending on which country they're in, if they're in a city or the country, if they're rich or poor, and how old they are. Roots and Jutes has been very active in South Korea, and there's a group there that is studying an endangered species of frog. They found a, a new group of them that weren't thought to exist. We got about 2,000 groups across China, and they're doing tree planting. Uh, there's a lot of cleaning up the environment, moving trash, educating uh, their parents. They are learning about the importance of preserving the forest because of its capacity to absorb CO2 and give out oxygen. Since 1980, greenhouse gas emissions have doubled, bringing irreversible global warming. So today, much of Jane Goodall's campaigning is focused on climate change. Everywhere I was meeting young people who'd lost hope. And when I asked them, why do you feel like this? Well, because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. So we have been stealing their future. We're still stealing it today. But I didn't believe there was nothing that could be done. And I still believe there's a window of time when if we get together, we can start healing some of the harm and at least slowing down this changing climate. The problem is that unless we can alleviate poverty, then people absolutely cannot make ethical choices because in an urban area you have to buy the cheapest food. You can't afford to ask where it came from. You've got to survive. If you're out in, you know, in, in rural areas, you're going to cut down the last tree in your desperate effort to grow food or make charcoal or catch the last fish because you have to do so to survive. Hunting has devastated the chimp population in Central Africa. Goodall's Chimpunga Sanctuary cares for 148 orphaned or injured animals. Jane recently returned to witness the release of a now recovered chimp called Wunda to a safe reserve. It was the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. It's not a typical chimpanzee embrace at all. It's just very deliberate. I think I've always had an ability to connect with animals on a different level from, from normal. And I suppose she sensed something. I don't know. I can't explain it. Wunda had been near to death before her rehabilitation. But to Jane Goodall, there's no such thing as a hopeless case. And she believes that that principle must also be applied to our environment. The most important message that I would have for everybody who's listening, watching, is that you make a difference every single day. And that though you may feel that your actions are insignificant in relation to the overall problems around the world, it's not just you. There are more and more thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world who are making ethical choices every single day. And this is moving us towards a better future.